Some of you might have figured this out by now, but I generally compose and film my devotionals about a week in advance, a week before they get sent out. Now, I was looking back at all the, the devotionals that I've written, and, I, and the first one I composed was, was way back on May 3rd, 2021. That's one a week for over two years. It's funny to look back. My original intention was, was simply to take a look at some of the high points in the book. I believe my exact words were, we're probably not going to go verse by verse, but I'll cover enough to give us a good lay of the land. Well, hopefully if you've tuned in to at least some of these, plus uh, the 38 sermons we did on Acts, and you've got a good lay of the land. So where do we wrap up? Now, as we looked at last week, uh, Paul's in Rome, All the synagogue leaders had arranged for a day to come and hear from him. Of course, Paul inevitably experiences with these leaders the same thing he faced again and again in ministry. Rejection. Strictly speaking, it's not that they're rejecting Paul. They were rejecting his message of Jesus. Now, it's also worth pointing out that not everyone rejected the message. Verse 24 tells us some were convinced by what he said. Well, others refuse to believe. Now, that's really important because uh, Paul goes on to quote Isaiah 6, stating, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Now, Paul follows that with with a line, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. These are strong words. And while they may apply to a large portion of the Jews in Rome, it's clearly not everyone. Some believed. So when we read verse 30, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him, that all isn't specified Jew or Gentiles. It's all. It's, it's probably both. Now, finally, we're told in, in verse 31, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Think about that. Why doesn't Paul proclaim forgiveness of sins? You could argue that in, in teaching about the Lord Jesus, forgiveness of sins is implicit but it doesn't get lead billing. Nor does salvation as a free gift of grace for that matter. Or that Paul proclaimed that by faith in Jesus, you get to go to heaven when you die. Does it strike you as odd that the thing that we take to be of utmost importance aren't listed? Instead, Paul's talking about the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's the gospel. The kingdom of God is the gospel. You don't believe me? Well, ask Jesus. Mark's gospel tells us that after Jesus returns from the wilderness to begin his ministry, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Verse 14 tells us Jesus proclaimed the good news. Verse 15 tells us what the good news is. The kingdom of God has come near. What should we do? Turn around. Believe in it. I'm not saying that salvation by grace and the promise of an eternity spent with Jesus isn't the best thing that's ever happened to us. I'm just saying that the gospel is even bigger than that. Which is why for two years in the heart of the greatest kingdom of the world, the world had known to that time, Paul didn't give a rip about Rome or Caesar. He told them that in Jesus, God's kingdom had come and that the news was so good, nobody could shut his mouth. Repent and believe. We've got a great king and his kingdom is here. It's still coming, but in him it's here. Amen. Amen.